Well, as we begin this morning, I'd like you to, to ask you to just imagine with me for, for just a moment what it would be like if, if your favorite author had just come out with their latest book, and you ordered it on Amazon, and you got home from work, and sure enough, there's the Amazon package on the counter, and you rip it open, and there's that book. And you're excited. You want to, you want to jump in, and you want to just start reading that new book, because all, all the other books by that author have been so good, and and so you're really excited, but you, you fix dinner for the family, and you sit down, and you eat dinner together, and you spend some time with your kids, and you finally tuck them into bed, and you, you, you get on your favorite recliner, and take and you open the book. And you skip the first two-thirds of the book, and you begin reading on page 231. And as you read, you're thinking to yourself, Man, this, this book just isn't nearly as good as all the other books that this author has written. I mean, usually their books are great, but this one just doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, the plot doesn't make much sense. The characters aren't really well developed. Now, the problem isn't with the book, is it? The problem is, is with the approach that you've taken to that book. But what I find is a lot of people take almost that same approach with the Bible. They begin and, and they begin reading these, these biographies of Jesus and they read letters that Paul and, and Peter and John and some of the other apostles have written. But they, they kind of skip the first two-thirds of the book. And they do that for various reasons. They, they might think, well, well, first of all, it's called what? The Old Testament. And who wants to read something old? You know, let's read something new. So, so I'm just going to ignore that. And there's some really unpronounceable names and places in there that don't make a lot of sense. And, and sometimes I struggle with that. There's some things that don't make a whole lot of sense to us, right? I mean, God gives commands to go and wipe out whole communities and whole nations of people. And, and that kind of offends our sensibilities sometimes. And frankly, it's just long and hard to understand. It's, it's like twice as long as the New Testament. So what do we do? A lot of times we just tend to ignore it and we jump in to the New Testament. And we begin to read the New Testament and we find the same thing that we found by reading the other books. Sometimes we don't quite get all the plot nuances. Sometimes not all the characters are really fully developed. And so what we're going to do for really for most of the rest of the year is we're going to go on this journey to try and see if we can't take this Old Testament and make it much more relevant to our lives. We're going we're gonna to take and we're going to try to weave together some of these stories of the, the most important characters that we find in the Old Testament. Obviously, God, His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But some of the other ones, and we're going to try to weave those stories together so that we can get a picture of what God is like and how God operates and, and where Jesus is in the Old Testament and what that means for all of us. Now, now frankly, I'm, I'm excited about this. I'm excited because I had a really great Old Testament professor that really gave me a love for the Old Testament. And and so I'm excited to take you on this journey and hopefully to bring you along with me so that you too will have the same kind of excitement about the Old Testament. But I'm also a little apprehensive about this because frankly, this is a whole different approach to, to preaching that I've really ever taken before. This is something new for me. So, so, so I'm kind of going out on a limb. I'm kind of going out into an area that's a little outside my comfort level. And, and maybe the same will be true for some of you. As we go through this time. Now you'll notice this morning that, that your sermon outline is a little bit different than usual. There's no, there's no fill in the blanks there. Because basically this, the message today, and probably a lot of them I think in this series, are going to take more of a kind of a narrative form. And so it doesn't really lend itself to that. So, so take some notes as you like. Now kids have gotten a little bit more information on their handouts. And parents, you may have to help them with a few of those things. Because there's not going to be lines up on the screen that they can copy and and fill in, but I think they'll, it'll help them to really listen and to, to see what we're going to do this morning. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and take them out to Genesis chapter 1. I think all of us can actually find that passage very easily this morning, can't we? Genesis 
The Bible begins with some very simple words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then in chapters 1 and 2, the author Moses goes on to, to explain more about how God did that. Actually, chapters 1 and 2 are, are kind of two different angles of the creation story. Sometimes people get those a little confused because they think that they're different. But really what happens in chapter 1, we find God's creation. Then in chapter 2, he comes back and describes a little bit more the creation of man. And it's really interesting. If you look through this, this creation account, here's what you'll find. God begins, he says, he speaks. And he says, let there be light. And every day on creation, day one, two, three, four, five, six, God speaks and he says, let there be something. And he, he speaks this creation into existence. But then something really interesting happens. On day six, when he makes man, he doesn't just speak man into existence. It tells us in verse 25, it says that 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 God said, let us make man in our own image. And when you get to chapter 2, here's what you find about how God creates man. He doesn't just speak him into existence. He loves man so much that he takes, he, he literally takes his hand and he scoops up the dust of the earth and he, he forms man. And then he blows life into that man. His own breath that he blows into him to create life. That's how much God loves all of us. He, he was willing to not just speak us into existence, but to create us with His hands to breathe life into each one of us. We see that right off the bat, which is pretty exciting. And we see something else that, that indicates just how much we mean to God. All, every day, God goes along this creation. He says, it is good, it is good, it is good. And then when He gets to verse, or to day six, after He creates man, what does He say? It is very good. Because now He's... He's created man. So, so things are very good. And then we get to chapter 4, which we're going to look at next week. And we see in chapter 4 that, that we have the world's first murder. So here's the question. What happened between chapters 1 and 2 where things were very good and chapter 4 where we have one brother murdering another brother? We find the answer to that question in Genesis chapter 3. And because of that, I think Genesis chapter 3 is in, is in many ways, it's the most crucial, it's the most pivotal chapter in all of the scriptures. Because e even if this was the only chapter of the Bible we had, we could, we could understand some great things about God. We could understand some, some great things about ourselves. And we could see Jesus there. So this morning, we're going we're gonna to look at that chapter, chapter 3. Let me read that passage, and you can follow along as I read. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the trees fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will, surely, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, I love this, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, and she has her own excuse, doesn't she? What is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, 
Cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. This morning, we're going to answer four questions about this passage. We're going to first of all ask, what does this passage reveal to us about God? Secondly, what does it reveal about me? Third, how do we reconcile this idea of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility? And fourth, where is Jesus in this passage? So let's begin with the first one. What does this passage tell me about God? Really, several things that we learn about God here is, in fact, as I said earlier, if all we had was Genesis chapter 3, we could learn a lot about God here. The first thing we see about God is that God is sovereign. He's the one who created the earth just just as He wanted it to be. He's sovereign over this, this entire creation. He makes the rules. He sets the boundaries. He does everything according to His plan. So, So we see here, first of all, that God is 100% sovereign. The next thing we see here is that that God is loving. And He's gracious. And He's merciful. We see that all throughout throughout the passage here, don't we? I mean, we see it, first of all, what what happens when Adam and Eve sin? They, They run off and they hide. And what does God do? He seeks after them. God comes after them. He doesn't wait for them to come back to Him. He goes after them because of His love and His grace and His mercy. And don't you like the way that that God does that here? I mean, think about it. If one of of us were God and somebody sinned, what would we do? Man, we would want to just drop the hammer on Him. We'd We'd probably let Him stew for a while there, you know? kind of rustle around the bushes every once in a while so that they'd look around and and see where God was. Kind of make them feel the, the, the shame and the guilt of their sin. But God doesn't do that. He approaches them with, with grace and mercy. Notice, it's really interesting. God, God asks questions of Adam and Eve. He doesn't, <coughs> excuse me, He doesn't begin to just shout statements at them. Now, He's going to do that with the serpent. But for Adam and Eve, He asks questions. As a matter of fact, The first question we ever find in the Bible is found right here when when God says, where are you? Now, God didn't need to ask that question because he didn't know where Adam and Eve were. I mean, God knew where they were. But God asked these questions because he uses this series of questions to help Adam and Eve begin to recognize their own sin in their life. And so he shows this, this, this grace in this mercy in their lives. The other way that we see that is, is towards the end of the chapter, it talks about the fact that, that God clothes them with animal skins. And we're going to talk about the spiritual significance of that a little bit later. But for now, what I want you to see is this, that, that God is gracious. He provides for their needs, even though they absolutely don't deserve it. So, so we see our God's sovereign. We see that He's full of grace and mercy and love. But on the other hand, We also see that God is holy and that He's righteous and that He's just. He doesn't say to Adam and Eve, well, 
well, that's okay. Your, your sin, don't, don't worry too much about it. He imposes some serious consequences on them as a result of their sin because that's His nature. Is He loving? Absolutely. But at the same time, He's only also holy and righteous and just. So we see that about God here in this passage. Finally, even the act of, of sending Adam and Eve out of the garden and putting a guard there, that's also, it's also his justice, but it's also an act of grace and mercy, isn't it? Because think about it. Had Adam and Eve been able to go back into that garden and eat of the, tree, of, the fruit, of the fruit of the tree of life, they would have spent all their life separated from God with no, no chance whatsoever of being redeemed. And that would not have been the kind of life that they wanted to lead at all. So, so God here, He's a God who's sovereign. He's a God who's, who's loving, but He's also a God who is just. We see that here in this passage. What does this passage tell me about me? Man, there's so much here that, that we could look at, probably more than we could, we could possibly cover. But the first thing that we see here is that God gives me the ability to make choices. When God created Adam and Eve, He didn't didn't make them robots. He gave them the ability to make choices in their life. He gave them the ability, in this case, to either listen to the voice of God and be obedient to that, or to listen to the voice of Satan and be obedient to that. He gave them the ability to, to make those choices. We also see here that that along with the ability to make those choices, he gave them the responsibility to make wise choices as well. What he says here is that, that we're responsible for making wise choices. And when we fail to do that, there are some serious consequences to our choices. Adam and Eve certainly found that out, didn't they? There were some, there were some serious consequences that that were going to come into their life as a result of the sin that they committed, the fact that they made choices that weren't wise. I mean, think about it. For, for Eve, even though God's redemption was going to come through the birth of a, of a Messiah down the road who would be born to a woman, the woman from now on was going to experience pain in childbirth. All you women here know about that who have had children, right? That... The consequence of that sin didn't just end with Adam and Eve. It remains even today. And think about Adam. Adam, God says, the ground that you work is going to be cursed. And and the implication here is up until now, Adam and Eve had cultivated the earth. It had been something of joyful. Their work was, was, was something they enjoyed, something that was fulfilling. But now he says, it's going to be hard work. You're going to sweat. Up till then, I I don't think Adam and Eve sweated. So God creates this whole industry right there of creating chemicals that we can put under our arms to keep us from sweating and and smelling bad when we do. It's really interesting, though, if you look carefully, what you find here is that that God never curses Adam and Eve directly. He, He curses the things that are around them, the parts of their life, but He never says, cursed are you, like He does to the serpent. So there are consequences to sin, but God is still pouring out His grace and His mercy and His love in their life. So there are those consequences to our sin. So now that we've answered those first two questions, what does this tell me about God? What does this tell me about me? We're now ready to kind of tackle the third question. This is probably the most difficult of all of them to answer here. How do we reconcile the concept of God's sovereignty, which we have seen, and man's responsibility, his ability to make wise decisions? The simple answer to that question is we don't. And the reason that we don't have to reconcile those ideas is is think about what the word reconcile means. We've talked about that a lot lately, right? The idea of reconciling is to take two things that have been separated and to bring them back together. Well, I would suggest to you that the only reason that the idea of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility are separated because it's that way in our own mind. It's not that way in God's mind. God doesn't have to take those things separately. In in His eyes, 
They both exist. The Scripture teaches both things. We've seen it here in Genesis. We saw it, we've seen it in Romans. We've seen it throughout the Scriptures. God is sovereign, but man also has a responsibility to make his decisions. Notice here, I'm being really careful with my words. I'm not saying man's free will. I think there's a problem with that because the idea of free will would be kind of this idea, well, I can just do anything I want. And that's certainly not true because because God places some some limits, doesn't He, on on those decisions we can make. In a lot of ways, this idea of of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility, they're kind of like the parallel rails of a railroad track. Think about it. The train, what does it need? It needs both of those rails at the same time, right? And our lives are like that too. We need to understand God's sovereignty. We also need, at the same time, to understand our responsibility. And and our lives are only going to work well if we stay on both rails at the same time. If we ever get off one rail or the other, we're going to have some issues in our life. Now, as I said, our, our ability to make decisions is not completely unlimited. When God, in His sovereignty, created the universe, He he put some limits on what man could do. He says to Adam and Eve, He says, here's your responsibilities. I want you to be fruitful and multiply. I want you to have dominion over all my creation, which means that you're to be good stewards of this creation. And He says, you're not to eat of the fruit of one tree in the garden. You can eat all the other ones, but don't eat this. And within those limits, God gave Adam and Eve a whole lot of leeway to make decisions, didn't he? About He didn't micromanage their lives. He, he let them make decisions. But they were, they were limited by what God allowed them to do. Let me, let me see if I can illustrate this. Let's suppose that uh, we had a big monsoon storm and that the Rito River was flowing water through it down there. Happens every once in a while. I, I'm always, it's always funny when people come in from out of town and they... They drive across, across the Rito River and they go, this doesn't look like a river to me. But let's suppose it was flowing with water and you had to go down to the auto mall. So you're driving down Oracle Road and you come to the river and now you have a decision. Will I cross the river or not? You can make that decision, right? But here's what you can't do. You can't fly across the river, can you? Not unless, you have, not unless you're in a plane or a helicopter, I suppose. You can only cross that road on the bridge because that's what's been provided for you so you have the ability to make that decision to cross or not cross but you can't just do it any old way that you want and i think that's kind of how god's sovereignty and and man's ability to to make decisions and his responsibility kind of work we have the ability up to a point to make these decisions but god is still sovereign and here's the other great thing about god's sovereignty God's sovereignty means that when we mess our lives up, that God is able to take this big old mess that we have and He's able to put it right again and He's able to make something good out of it. Even when we totally mess things up. And He does that for Adam and Eve here. I mean, their life is not what what it could have been, but God still takes care of them and protects them and watches over them. Finally, where's Jesus in this passage? Now, I got to tell you, we're going to get to some passages in the Old Testament where that question may be a little harder for us to answer than here. But frankly, Jesus is all over these first three chapters of Genesis. Let me just let me just point out a couple of places where we find Jesus here. First of all, go back to Genesis chapter one. I think verse 25, where where God says, what does he say? Let us make man in our image plurals there right that's that's interesting certainly a reference there to the triune nature of god father son and holy spirit jesus was there he was present as part of the the creation as a matter of fact go to Col- if you go to colossians 1 later pa- paul writes about that he says that jesus was was involved in creating everything that's ever been created in the history of the world so we see jesus Present at the creation. Second place we see Jesus present here, and, and I won't be real dogmatic about it, but, but I think when they hear God walking in the garden, I think that that's probably Jesus. I mean, think about it. God, 
God has three parts, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Spirit, Holy Spirit. They're spirits. They aren't physical beings. The only one who, who takes on flesh, a body of flesh, is Jesus. Now, I'm not saying God can't possibly do that, but, but I think there's a good chance here that this is the first of what we call Christophanies in the Old Testament. Their, their appearances of Jesus in the Old Testament were in the flesh. He appears on earth for a period of time before His incarnation. Again, I, I can't be dogmatic, but I think that's probably Jesus walking in the garden with them. Now, the place where we really see Jesus here is a, a really interesting place. It's in chapter 3, verse 15. And let me just uh, read that verse for us again. Here's what it says, verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now, we know from the New Testament that this serpent was really Satan taking on the appearance of a serpent there. So really, he's speaking directly to Satan here. And he says, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman. I'm going to put enmity between her offspring and your offspring. It, it refers to this cosmic battle that's been going on since Genesis 3 between the, the sons of Satan, the sons and daughters of Satan, and the sons and daughters of the Messiah, who's clearly laid out for us here. So there's that battle. But then he gets to the last part of that verse and he uses single pronouns, he and he. I, Adam and Eve could never have possibly seen this. As a matter of fact, I would say that probably no one ever saw this until Jesus was born himself. But there's a reference here, isn't there, to the virgin birth of Jesus. Because it says here that 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 he will be born of the woman, the seed of the woman. Not the seed of the man and the woman, but the seed of the woman. And, and only Jesus has ever fulfilled that in all the history of the world because he was born, what? Of Mary, but no earthly father. His, his father was the Holy Spirit, was God himself. So there's a reference here to the virgin birth of Jesus. And then there's even a reference here about how Jesus is going to come and die on the cross. It talks about the fact that that he will bruise his heel. And guess what happened in a crucifixion? They nailed people to the cross. They would nail their feet to the cross. And what would they have to do? They would have to take those feet and they would have to push up in order to get breath. And guess what happened every time that that occurred? They would literally bruise their heel. But God would have the last word here because it, it, it makes it clear that that death, that the Messiah Jesus would suffer on the cross that that would be the death by which Satan would be defeated when his head got bruised. Isn't that exciting here? Here's Jesus. Here's the Messiah. Here's, here's the gospel laid out before us. Certainly not to the, the degree we have it now, but it's right here in Genesis chapter 3. One more place where I think we see a picture of Jesus here. Remember earlier I mentioned that, that God made garments from animal skins to clothe them? Guess what had to happen before those animal skins could become their clothes? What, hap what had to happen to the animals? They'd be slaughtered, right? Their blood had to be shed. And I, I, I don't think that's any accident. There's a picture here of the fact that the way that God was going to make man right with him again, the way that he was going to bring this reconciliation was through the shedding of blood of an innocent lamb, the lamb of God, Jesus Christ. So we see Jesus throughout this passage. Now, we shared a lot of information so far, but what does this really mean for my life? What are, what are a couple of implications for my life? Let me share with you just two of them this morning. There's obviously more than we could possibly cover. The first one here is that my sin is never a private matter. I mean, just listen to what people say in the culture today. You know, stay out of my bedroom. You know, what goes on behind closed doors in my house is none of your business. And I would agree to the extent that when it's talking about the government getting involved, there, that might be somewhat true. But the fact is, there is no such thing as private sin. There is no sin that you can commit that won't impact somebody else. Your spouse, your kids, your family, the people that you work with. It's not just a private matter. I mean, think about the sin of Adam and Eve. 
By the time we get to Genesis chapter 4, we find there's tremendous consequences of their sin. It wasn't just a private matter. So sin, my sin, is, is never just a private matter. The second thing that we see here is that while God may forgive my sin, when I confess them, He doesn't always take away the consequences of my sin. See, I, I think there was forgiveness that was made available to Adam and Eve. Made available through Jesus, by the way. We're going to talk a little bit more in our roundtable today about how we see Adam's faith shown here in this passage. But even though there was forgiveness available, God didn't take away the consequences of their sin. Like I say, next week we're going to see that it impacted their family to the point that we have the first murder take place. In fact, every one of us here in this room today, we're impacted by the sin of Adam, aren't we? We, we talked about that in Romans, how every single one of us have taken on the sin nature of Adam because we're one of his descendants. And, and so every one of our lives is impacted by the sin that Adam committed there that day. When we get to David, we're going to find out that the sin of one person, even though it gets for, forgiven, it impacts the history of a whole nation because of one sin. So while God may forgive our sins, He doesn't always take away the consequences of those sins. Sin is a horrible, destructive thing. It ruins lives. And so before we, we jump into sin, before we fall into sin, we need to think about that. We need to understand that. So now that we've taken... A peek at the opening chapters of the greatest book ever written. Do you see why we can't just jump ahead two-thirds into the book and pick up with the gospel account of Matthew? We need, to, we need to see the whole story. We need to let God develop these characters. We need to let God reveal Himself to us. We need to let see who we are in the eyes of God through the Old Testament. And once we do that, then we get a whole new, deeper understanding of the New Testament as well. I'm really excited about that, and I hope that you are too. Let's pray.